Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, North Texas. Welcome to our San Antonio audience. Uh, thank you for joining us on this wonderful occasion. I hope that you had a wonderful seminar. I was able to go around and uh, there were lots of vibrant discussions taking place. It was wonderful. Uh, many of the things that I heard. So uh, glad that was of, of uh, deep significance. Um, we're honored to have Dr. Jackson Crawford of the University of Colorado to speak to us about stories from Norse mythology. Dr. Crawford received his MA in linguistics from the University of Georgia and his PhD in Scandinavian studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has held teaching posts in Scandinavian studies at UCLA, UC Berkeley, and the University of Colorado, where he is currently a resident scholar at the center of the American West. Dr. Crawford is now a full-time public educator. His published translations have made classic Norse texts readily accessible in contemporary English idiom to popular audiences. These include the Poetic Edda, the Saga of the Volsungs, with the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, the Wanderers Halvamal, and very recently, two sagas of mythical heroes, Hervor and Heidrich, and Hrolf Kraki and his champions. Additionally, Dr. Crawford has developed a very extensive list of videos available on his Old Norse channel on YouTube. And these have provided him with the means to reach the widest audience, audiences with answers to all the most frequently asked questions about Old Norse language and mythology. His channel recently surpassed the 184,000 followers milestone. Congratulations. Crawford's university posts are impressive, but it is his deep desire to share his expertise in Norse language and myth outside of the ivory tower that has endeared him so, uh, to so many of us and shows the true measure of his generosity. Dr. Crawford, we are glad to have you join us. Uh, please come on up. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. How is my audio? You hear me all right? Thank you so much for your kind welcome. You know, while I was driving down here to the Metroplex a few days ago, I was driving through the panhandle and uh, I needed some gas and I'd kill the dragon at Clayton and some birds told me the right exit to take. <laughs> and so I pulled off and I found myself in a dusty little nothing of a crossroads town in the panhandle. You know how it is between like Amarillo and Jacksboro, right? I don't even remember what town it was, but at this crossroads gas station, I met the devil. <laughs> and I won't tell you what I promised to do for him, <laughs> but in exchange for my soul, he said that I would spend one hour less in purgatory for every time someone mispronounced Sigurd Drivumal in the next week. <laughs> so now I'm looking at just about no time. <laughs> the, uh, I am sorry about all the names. It is not my fault. <laughs> I didn't write this, I just translated it. Um, for the record, what they tell people in Iceland is shout the first syllable and whisper the rest. And that kind of helps. It does sort of help because all of these words are emphasized on the first syllable, right? Right, that's one, two, three. This is just a five syllable word. It's easy. But no one is judging. And uh, I promise you, students probably aren't. Although I will say, and I mean it as a sincere compliment, this is the first time I have been in a K-12 school and felt like I had something to live up to. And that includes when I was in K-12. <laughs> so my sincere compliments to you. I'm incredibly impressed with the school and with you, with you teachers. What I thought I would do is give you a little bit of extra context about what you've read and get into a couple of the themes that I saw in some of the seminars uh, that I happened to visit 
and then open this up for your questions and hopefully be able to make myself as useful to you as I can. So the Sigurdr story is one of the oldest known stories in the Germanic languages, the group of Indo-European languages that includes English. In fact, the earliest instantiation of this legend of the Dragon Slayer is in Beowulf. There, if, if you've ever read Beowulf, you know how many digressions there are. And one of the many digressions concerns Sigmund, which is actually Sigurd's father in the Norse tradition, killing a dragon and seizing its great treasure. So the story is at least as old as however old Beowulf is. And if any of you are English majors, you have opinions you'd cut my throat for about that, so I won't say a date. But in fact, since the story exists in versions in Scandinavia, in England, and in Germany that we all find in the early medieval period, we assume the story must in fact go back to a time when these languages were all one, which would be the early centuries AD before the migration period split up the Germanic languages. Now this story is found in many different versions with different levels of detail. And just like with other traditional stories, or I'm often quick to compare it to comic books, we sometimes find the same cast of characters, but different people doing different things, or in different orders, or someone is actually someone's parent who's their brother in a different tradition. That sort of variation is, is quite common. Um, but in the Norse tradition, the poems of the Poetic Edda represent the most cohesive, early, I would even dare say the word archaic version of the story as it's passed down in Scandinavia. But those individual poems, and the Poetic Edda contains about 30 poems. I know it sounds like I'm, I just didn't learn the number when I say about 30, but it's sometimes hard to draw a line between some of the poems, where they begin and where they end. In fact, uh, the three poems you read uh, for today don't have any sort of uh, marker separating them in the text. They just run right into one another on the manuscript page. Um, so there's about 15 poems of those 30 that concern the heroes of the Volsung family, mostly Sigurd the Dragon Slayer, and then, spoiler alert, he gets killed, and we get to hear about his wife and her brothers and their tragic ends, because everybody ends badly in the sagas. Now, those poems are not all composed by one person. They're not all composed in one place. They're all, all composed in one century. In fact, sometimes we can tell that these poems are very old, uh, just because their alliteration actually doesn't work in the language of the time when they were written. Right, the example that, so the manuscript, the Poetic Edda, the Codex Regis, is written in about the 1200s AD. Uh, some of the poems in the Volsung tradition are almost certainly to be dated to about the 800s AD in oral composition. They've been passed down for that long. People are sometimes curious about how we can guess that. The example that I use with students is uh, I'm a living fossil, right? I pronounce things in a way that's uncommon for a living English speaker. Uh, for example, I say things like what, where, and when, right? Now, if I were to compose alliterative poetry, I would alliterate the word what with the word house. To me, they both start with something like an H sound. If you had an anthology of poetry by people born in the 1980s, presumably I would be the only one doing that and everyone else would alliterate what with wall. But you could tell from mine, my alliterating what with house, that I still had this archaic distinction, right? I still distinguish what and when and where and which from which. And so it would tell you there was something odd about me, right? Which is that I'm a living fossil. But we see this sort of thing in the Poetic Edda where we have poems that, if we actually read them in the language of the 1200s when they're written down, they're not good poetry. The alliteration doesn't always work. But if we roll the clock back, they will actually work at an earlier stage of Old Norse, or specifically Old Icelandic, which is the dialect of these texts. So some of the Volsung's material is from as early as the 800s. Some of it is from as late as the 1100s. Now the conversion to Christianity in Iceland occurs 
in, and this is always easy to remember, the year 1000. So in fact, the composition of these stories continues after the conversion to a new religion. And I think that when people think about Norse mythology, often that's an underappreciated fact. Not only that these myths include not just stories of the gods, everyone knows who Odin, Thor, and Loki are, but half of these myths are about human heroes like Sigurd. Right? They're more like the Iliad in tone than they are like maybe Hesiod's Theogony. And the generation of these stories doesn't stop with the conversion. People continue to talk about these heroes. So the particular three poems that you read, which are Regensmol, Falfnismol, and Sigurdrivumol, hopefully you're all whispering those to yourself so that I'm getting less time in purgatory right now. <laughs> probably date from the late 900s, probably from just before the conversion, which is a, roughly the date for most of the poems in the Poetica. It's about an average date for those, those poems. Now, the Poetica actually, in terms of the Volsung material, begins with Sigurd's youth. The first poem about Sigurd actually has him going to his uncle, who is second sighted, he can see the future, and asking him what his future will be. And his uncle says, do you really want to know? And Sigurd says, yes. And he asks him this three or four different ways. Do you really want to know? And Sigurd keeps saying yes. So he says, okay. You know, well, you're going to be, you're going to be fostered by this dwarf. Um, you're going to kill a dragon who's his brother. Uh, he's going to try to betray him, but you're going to kill him before you can do that. Uh, some birds are going to talk to you. Uh, they're going to tell you to go meet these girls. Uh, one of them you're going to marry, and her brother's going to kill you. And, uh, oh, did I say that? But Sigurd just walks into all of this, right? He always seems surprised. Um, <laughs> right, there's no indication. It's, it's, it, the, you don't see a point where he's talking to the birds and he says, oh, you know, you're right, my uncle said something about this. <laughs> it, but, but it's part of what I like to call, in, in broad strokes, the dream logic of these stories. You know, when we approach these stories like like a series of novels or a TV series or a series of films, and we look for perfect continuity between you know, what came before and what came after, we're gonna be really, really disappointed, right? Sigurd dies three different ways just in the poems of the Poetic Edda, right? It's not like those are continuous stories. <laughs> like he doesn't come back to get betrayed three different ways. Um, these stories are much more like comic books Right, we have a consistent set of characters, right? Sigurd is always characterized the same way. He's always this bold, maybe slightly naive young man who for some reason, every single person and animal feels compelled to give advice to, <laughs> right? And he takes none of it except what the birds to give him. Although I've never gotten bad advice from a bird. Gotten bad advice from people, so I get it. Get a PhD in Scandinavian studies. But it's, it's, where was it going with this? The comic, it's, it's the dream logic of the comic book logic, right? He's the same person in all these stories. Certain broad strokes of his history are the same. He's killed a dragon at some point. Um, but the specific details are different, right? Which girl did he marry? Did he meet her twice before he married her or one time before he married her, right? These details uh, vary quite a bit. But if we approach them like that and we remember that these are the superheroes of their day and that these are not very similar to our uh, long narrative forms such as television or movies or, or novels, then I think that we'll be doing ourselves a better service in approaching these stories because they do contradict one another. You know, one, one point even within one poem that I saw in many of these discussions uh, brought up was when Sigurd is talking to the dragon Fafnir, right? <laughs> And here's something very, also very different from our storytelling. The fight takes like three words, <laughs> right? Sigurd stabbed him. Then we have a conversation, right? But the conversation starts with the dragon asking him who he is, right? And Dr. Rutherford asked for some Old Norse, so I'm gonna give you this in Old Norse just for some flavor. Was that a whoop of excitement? 
That's the, yeah. That's the first time this happened to me. So here's the dragon. Svein og Sveiden, hverjum ertu Sveini um borin? Hverra ertu mans mogar? Er þú að fáðni reyt þinnin fróna mekki? Stondum k til hjarta hjór. Fróðnir continues. Góðug dýr ek heiti en ek gengið hefk en móðurlausu mogar. Fóður ek ok a sem fyrir sinnir geng ek ein saman. Veitstu, ef fóðurinn er ottat sem fyrir sinnir, að hverju vartu undri alin? And Sigurður responds, and here you can hear him say his name and his father's name. Eftir ni mitt kveðik þér ókunnugt verra og mig sjálfan et sama. Sigurður ek heiti. Sigmundur hets min fader er hefk þik vopnum veget. Beyond the names, you probably also recognize some basic vocabulary. It's very similar between these closely related languages. Min fader, right, my father. The words for father are almost the same. Here, the dragon asks him, who are you? Who was your dad? And at first, Sigurdur says, I don't have a name. <laughs> I don't have a dad. <laughs> and the dragon legitimately seems confused. If you don't have a name, what do people call you? If you don't have a dad, where'd you come from? And then, of course, Sigurdur says, well, I will never tell you my name or my family. I'm named Sigurdur, my dad is Sigurdur. <laughs> right? And it's like, what is going on here? The prose, and, and remember that the prose that these poems are framed in is not necessarily as old as the poetry. The prose could be as late as the, the, the editor of this particular manuscript just adding some clarifying material. So we can't always take it uh, at face value as being quite as archaic a story as the, as, as the poetry. But the prose does say that, that Sigurdur disguised his name because he was concerned about being cursed. Right, much like in Dungeons and Dragons, you know, someone's full name, they might be able to curse you. But Fafnir never curses him. And in fact, Fafnir seems kind of weirdly concerned for Sigurd's welfare. Right? Don't sail too close to shore. <laughs> right? It goes like, right? Sigurd will never get into a boat again, by the way. <laughs> like, you know, he gives him this, this weirdly disconnected advice. He's very patient with Sigurd's questions about stuff like, where do the Norns come from, the ones that give us our fates? And what is the name of the battlefields where the gods will fight their enemies? It's, it's, and it's, it's, the dragon even warns him, by the way, this treasure cost my death. What cost yours too? My, my brother betrayed me, he'll betray you too. The, the dragon is, is sort of concerned for him. So why does Sigurdur hide his name? Probably it does have something to do with this notion of being cursed, but then pushing one very thin layer further, why does he not reveal his name to begin with if he's just gonna do it later? Well, you might notice that in these stories, and this is true of all the Norse myths as well as the sagas, we never get internal monologue. We don't hear Sigurdur thought to himself, right? That never happens. In fact, I can think of one story where we get any kind of internal monologue at all the Eddas and sagas. It's not this one. I think part of what's happening is that the narrator is actually doing, they, they, they barely know how to write internal monologue, they just don't do it. This is how he shows sort of what Sigurdur is thinking, oh gosh, I shouldn't tell my name. But it has to come as actual spoken dialogue. We're seeing the thought process, we're seeing the fear. And it comes back to when I said this, it's, it's not just a little bit like comic books, but a little bit like the logic of dreams. Right, in a dream, you might say for some reason to your worst enemy, oh, my worst fear is X, right? it's spiders or something, only to say, oh my gosh, why did I say that to my worst enemy? Because of course, later in the dream, you're savaged by spiders sent by your enemy. <laughs> so again, in, in, in narrative structures, these are much more like comic books or maybe more like dreams than like TV shows or, or movies, at least the TV shows in the last 20, 25 years that have been more uh, continuous than like Gunsmoke was. <laughs> so that's one theme I wanted to mention uh, uh, briefly. Another one that I wanted to mention was the, you know, it's such a cliche to talk about how like, I cannot translate this into English, 
<laughs> right? You know, in La France, it was much more beautiful, right? I, I always hate this sort of like pedantic attitude toward like, well, you know, I could explain it to you, but I have to use French. Um, but <laughs> languages do talk about things differently, right? There's a different semantic taxonomy to different languages. I can go on and on and on about how different languages talk about color. That was my dissertation, is how Old Norse talks about color. But one thing that you've seen in these three poems that's actually very hard to translate is Old Norse is judgmental. So a little bit of background to this. If you read through just any of, any of the sagas, pick one up, read the introduction of any given character, and in, except in very few cases, we're going to start with some of the good things. He was a bold man. He was considered wise. He was considered handsome. But <laughs> and then the but might be pretty brutal. Right? But he had awful teeth, and men often compared him to a toothless donkey. <laughs> he was therefore called Gunnar Toothless Donkey. <laughs> it's, they are really brutal about foregrounding people's faults, and everyone's got them. Um, you, and, and so just about any quality that you can attribute to a person, there is a way to say it in Old Norse that's complimentary, and a way to say it that's not so complimentary. And that's sometimes hard to parallel in English. Uh, one way that you saw this in, 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 in the text you read is with wisdom. There's all these ways of talking about how people are smart. And some of them have very positive connotations and some of them have very negative connotations, right? There's six or seven common adjectives that roughly mean smart. And so I try to convey some of the sense of them with rough English parallels, but we just don't have quite the same punch you in the face judgments as some of these words have, right? So I try to say wise for some of the more positive terms or sly for some of the more negative terms perhaps. But uh, one of the best uh, pairs to talk about here, <laughs> I feel like a, it's like a door with a prize back here that I'm gonna open. <laughs> is in terms of intelligence, Sigurdr has, oh, this may not be, is that good? Oh, you can see screen. I forgot about that. <laughs> All right, say this three times to reduce my time in purgatory. Sigurdr has Vistomr. You can see this is, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is good. It's literally good for my soul. <laughs> this, you, you can tell this is related to our word wisdom, right? And this is a positive term, right? This, this is, uh, I like to say, this is the kind of intelligence that tells you how to do the brave thing, right? But then Regan, his foster father, is credited as having slugth. Thank you. Notice it even kind of sounds bad. Um, this is the intelligence that tells you how to get out of doing the brave thing. Right? So how to do the brave thing, how to get out of doing the brave thing. And I hate to be that pedantic translator, but it's a little hard to get that across in one word in English. I guess the best I can do is probably something like wisdom and deviousness. But that's part of what's going on there when you see different attitudes toward people being smart. It can be good and it can be bad. And uh, one of the seminar sections that I popped in on had a great discussion that got into wolves. Because you see wolves come up time and again in these three poems in both good and bad contexts. So as uh, Hraithmar dies, he says, have a wolf fierce daughter. Uh, obviously, it's supposed to be a good thing. She's supposed to father a son who's going to be fierce enough to avenge him. But then we also see uh, uh, one of the birds says, and this is actually a proverb in Old Norse, uh, I always suspect a wolf when I see a wolf's ears sticking up. And that's clearly negative. 
Uh, but then we have a more positive sense when Battlestar, Old Norse, Nikkar, uh, or Odin is talking to uh, young Sigurd and telling him that one of the good omens for a battle is a wolf howling. Well, there's a good and a bad word for wolf, right? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, right, there's this one, which looks like our word, wolf, and it is, uber. And then the bad one, varger. You might name a son Ulver, you wouldn't name your son Varger. And you know, I think that it's a little bit like the attitude toward predatory animals among people who live around them still today. I know that in my own family, the attitude toward rattlesnakes kind of mirrors this, right? Oh, rattlesnake, cool. You know, a bunch, a bunch of my family friends have, you know, rattlesnake tattoos or something. Like, he's fast like a rattlesnake, but still, ha, huh, rattlesnake. Right, it's positive in you being used against your enemies, but it's negative being used against you. So we, we have a similar duality in talking about these things. We just don't necessarily have these very basic judgmental words that you have to choose one or the other the way that you do in Old Norse. Um, by the way, this goes as far as beauty. You can talk about beauty in more positive and more negative terms, or at least doubtlessly positive terms and terms that suggest there may be some kind of a reservation about it. Uh, I'll show you this too. <clears throat> so, if I read when a, when a character is introduced in a saga as fagr, which is related to our word fair, right? I, this, is, this is always good. This is, this is nice. It's, it's a compliment. This person looks nice, and I'm not supposed to have any reservations about it. But if I see the term frither, this might mean very handsome or very beautiful, but there's some reservation about it, right? Like maybe it's sort of forced, especially if used of decoration. This can be something like over ornate, over embellished. It's like it's, it's, too, it's too done. Um, Old Norse can do this with just about any context. It finds you some kind of good and some kind of negative judgment, no matter what you are talking about. And I think that's interesting. It's a, it's a, a curious cultural preoccupation. We kind of do it, but I don't feel like we're as obligated to do it by our language. And it does pose some challenges for a translator. One last theme I'll quickly touch on that I saw in many of the seminars that I just want to give a little bit more context about is uh, advice. Everywhere Sigurd goes, and this isn't his whole story, he's given advice, right? He meets the girl that the birds say to go marry, and she's beautiful, and they seem to sort of fall in love, and then it's like, give me <laughs> six pages of advice, <laughs> right? Um, tell me about runes, and she really just tells him about them, right? She's it's like, Here's how, to, here's how to make a beer rune, whatever that's supposed to do. Uh, sorry to say I don't know. Um, it's, you, you should know these things. All right. Uh, he, it's, th th these stories are just obsessed with putting our protagonists in situations where they get advice. Do they follow it? Almost never. Right. It, it becomes kind of a trope after you read many of the Norse sagas. Uh, the protagonist getting advice is being told what not to do that he is going to do like 10 chapters from now, right? Uh, the same thing applies to dreams. You know, one of my favorite examples is, is in uh, one of the sagas of Isenders. There's a hero who's traveling with his two brothers and uh, they're crossing some land that belongs to some enemies that said, we'll kill you if you cross our land. And he says, I wanna take a nap. <laughs> so he lays down and he takes a nap and he wakes up and he says, I had a terrible dream. Could you tell me what it means, my brothers? I said, well, what was it? He says, I dreamed I was one of three wolves and I was crossing the land of another wolf pack and the other two wolves were killed. What could it mean? <laughs> <laughs> and the hero never, like the hero can never figure it out. And one of the brothers says, well, I think this means that, you know, these guys were crossing the land of who said they were killed. So they're going to kill me. And the other brother. 
No, that couldn't be it. Anyway, <laughs> let's keep going. Like it, it's, this, it's like advice and prophecies are there to get ignored, there to get broken in a way that I feel like it's not quite like any other literature. You get a lot of prophecies in, in Greek literature too, but I don't feel like it's quite as, as, as troped out that way. Um, last remark before I hopefully can uh, clear up your questions, comments, criticisms, complaints, and manifestos. The, uh, like I said, the, the last half of the Poetic Edda consists of individual poems like this that don't tell one cohesive story that you can read from beginning to end. These three poems are kind of unique in that they do tell a more or less cohesive story together. But there was a editor that, uh, in the 1200s who took these poems as well as many others that didn't make it into the Poetic Edda and put them together into one cohesive asterisk story, because <laughs> it's not quite cohesive the way we want, but it's better, uh, from beginning to end, telling the story of seven generations of the Volsung family. And that is the saga of the Volsung. So when we talk about sagas in, in, in Norse literature, we're talking about a specific prose genre, not about these, these, these poems. Um, and the saga of the Volsungs clears up many of the details that are left a little bit uncertain in the poems. For instance, we get the whole story of, of Sigurd's dad and his grandfather and his great-grandfather and his great-grandfather. This is just how these things go. Um, one of the funnier things, though, about the saga of the Volsungs is that the editor knows all these different poems about, you know, like he's, he's got three different versions of how Sigurd died. He's got two different versions of how he met the Valkyrie. It's like, he can't quite stand to choose between them, so you kind of get all of them, <laughs> right? Uh, which is its own storytelling issue. He meets the Valkyrie twice. It's complicated. <laughs> Speaking of complicated, you get to meet his dad, Sigmunder, and his son-nephew, Sinfjotli. Think about it, it's as bad as it sounds. <laughs> well, I would like to take whatever questions, remarks, criticisms, complaints, or manifestos you might have for me. Let me hopefully be a resource to you. Where is the source of the rules for this route? Okay. Right, so, so to dig into a little bit of background on this, one of the really striking things about Norse mythology is that the gods are a long way from omnipotent. And they're certainly not immortal, right? The world exists before them. The world will exist after them. They will all die at Ragnarok and a new world will rise out of the sea after that, which is its own sort of complicated story. But they are not capable of just doing anything they want. In fact, for the most part, they use mortal agents. Right? Brynhild is a Valkyrie who is assigned to kill the men that Odin wants killed in battle. Odin doesn't personally go down and spear these guys. He's got mortal agents doing it for him. And the gods have a lot of foibles um, and a lot of vulnerabilities. And um, you, you can see this in the way that each one of the major gods has some kind of permanent injury. Odin is missing an eye. Tyr is missing a hand. Heimdall is probably missing an ear. Uh, Thor has shrapnel embedded in his brain that can't be taken out. They all have some kind of permanent injury. They're, they're maimed. So, in a sense, uh, you know, I've sometimes heard the description of the Greek gods as being something a little bit more like big brothers to us mortals down here. I feel like that's even more true of the Norse gods. They are just more empowered versions of us who age also. And, and die also and can be permanently injured. Um, and that obsession with advice extends to the gods. Right? So one of the great poems of the Poetic Edda, and in fact the longest poem in the Poetic Edda, is... Y'all will get tired of the music joke. I won't. That is my superpower. I never get tired of a joke. Is Havamal, 164 stanzas, mostly 
of practical advice from the god Odin. And when I say practical advice, I mean, this gets down to relieving yourself, right? And it's, it's, it's very, very basic. Why would a god be concerned with this? But apparently the gods have the same sort of obsession with, with advice like that as, as humans do. And um, in many of the poems in the first half of the Poetic Edda that concern adventures of the gods, uh, the gods that have a sort of younger persona, Thor, uh, Freuer, will receive advice in a way sort of similar to these mortal heroes as well. Uh, so it's, it is interesting the way that this, there is some continuity there. It's almost as if the gods too uh, need some kind of, a, of guidance going forward in a world that they didn't create and that they are not, uh, uh, that, what's, the, what's the word, they're not the, necessarily the deciding ruling factors in. We have these shadowy beings called the Norns who determine fate and they determine the gods' fates too. We don't know much about them, but they are much more in charge than the gods themselves. Does that get close to your question? Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. I'm getting some texts here that uh, suggest people don't have my number. Uh, Rick, Logan, could you please place the number at the bottom of the screen over here? And then I'm going to write the number up on the whiteboard as well. This is that so way, dangerous. That way we can get texts from San Antonio. <laughs> I'm going to get a burner phone and send you a text later. It's going to make you regret this. Yes, please no hanky-panky here, okay, guys? <laughs> so a couple more questions related to the positive and negative duality of words. Sure. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, I had made a big study of color. So there's good and bad ways of saying certain colors. Um, is that a cheer for color? Yeah. Oh, the best audience ever. Okay, so here's an example of good and bad color. This is brown, this is good and bad brown. Okay, <laughs> so this brun is bad. This is actually the one related to our word and, and yarper is the good one. So, you know, your muddy shoes or um, a dead forest or something like that is probably going to be but um, flowing brown hair or, uh, or, or a well-fed horse or something like that is going to be yarper. They mean more or less the same thing technically, but it's a positive versus negative connotation in, in terms of uh, that color. Let me think, oh, what's another good example of this? Uh, I would actually turn this around a little bit and say, here's an example that still sort of survives in English. Fresh versus raw is sort of the same thing, right? Fresh fruit, raw fruit kind of have technically the same meaning, right? To me, I'm not a fruit expert, <laughs> right? But is that perhaps a kind of an example of something like this in English? Um, Oh, it's a good one. I gave you all my really good examples. I know there's something else at the top of my, tip of my tongue somewhere. Actually, okay, here's one from the mythology. Um, so we have the gods. This is secondary to this for a moment. The main gods in our stories are called the Asir gods. This is Odin, Thor, Tyr. Most of the gods that people know the names of anymore. There's also the Vanir gods, who seem somehow subordinate. They're not allowed to marry into the, uh, into the Asir. And then these families of gods are opposed to these other supernatural beings, often called the Jotnar. And the Jotnar are often translated giants. 
Uh, I will often translate it that way myself just because that's sort of the tradition now. But I don't like translating it giant because it makes it sound like they look different from the gods and they're bigger than the gods. They're the same size as the gods and they look the same. Some of them are, some of them look better than others, but they look just like humans, um, just like the gods do. Now these beings, my, lately I have started using the term anti-god. I'm, I'm feeling this out. You are one of the audiences I'm feeling this out with. They are of the same status, more or less. They have similar supernatural powers. They're similarly over human beings. They live far apart from human beings. And most of the gods are at least half one of these beings, right? Odin's mom is a Jotun, Thor's mom is a Jotun. They're all half, uh, quote unquote, giant. Okay, so getting back to your question, those beings, if we're talking about how Odin's mom or Thor's mom is one, we'll call them a Jotun, but there's a more negative term for them, Thors, which sets them up to be, you know, a negative character in a story, more of, a, more of an enemy. By the way, another negative word for them is troll. But I don't like translating a troll because it makes people think, you know, big pink hair thing, <laughs> which is the wrong image to have. Great. Um, we'll take a question from our San Antonio audience. We have a couple of folks basically wanting to know the end of the story since they didn't get that far. So what happens to uh, our character, who, which woman does he end up with, et cetera? <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Well, gosh, there's a long version of this. It's called the Saga of the Wilson. Um, so, by the way, in all sagas, and this is no exception, whoever the protagonist is, it does not go well for him. The protagonist in the saga is always going to have a bad time by the end of the story. It's never a happily ever after story. Um, Sigurdur, okay, he rides through the burning ring of fire right, to meet the Valkyrie, Sigurd Reaver, Brynhild. They promise to marry one another. He then goes and meets her again, according to the saga. They promise to marry one another again. She gives him advice again. This is the saga writer who's got two poems and he can't decide between them, so he just has them happen in sequence. By the way, the second time he meets her, among her advice to him, is never trust the promises of a woman. I promise to marry you. <laughs> so that's interesting. Um, Hovmal has a lot to say about this stuff. I, don't get me started on Hovmal. Uh, so then he will go find the other girl, Guthrun, the daughter of Gyuki. Uh, he will end up marrying her because her parents like him so much, they give him a potion of forgetfulness to forget Brynhild, uh, because he's always talking about Brynhild, right? She's his Canadian girlfriend that you'd totally love if you could meet her. <laughs> he takes, he drinks the potion, he forgets about her, he marries Guthrun. And then one of Guthrun's brothers, Gunnar, gosh, at this point I need to be putting this all on the board, but just for the fast forward here, her brother Gunnar says, hey, I need a wife. And his mom says, what about that Brynhild girl? And Sigurd says, I'll show you the way. I thought I forgot about her. <laughs> they go to Brynhild's burning ring of fire. They use another magic potion, so Sigurd changes faces with Gunnar. Sigurd rides through the burning ring of fire once again. He goes down, down through the burning ring of fire. <laughs> but this time he looks like Gunnar. So he gets her to promise to marry him, who's Gunnar. She comes back, gets married to Gunnar, somehow seems to also have forgotten Sigurd. Like maybe the potion affected her too. It's hard to say. <laughs> um, but then she and Sigurd's wife, Guthrun, go um, to bleach their hair. It's something they did back then too. They go out into a river. And Brynhild keeps going upstream of Guthrun to let the dreck wash off on Guthrun. And Guthrun says, hey, why are you doing that? 
I'm not a lower ranked woman than you. My husband isn't lower ranked than your husband. And Brynhild says, yes, he is. It's only my husband, Gunnar, who rode through the ring of fire. And Guthrum says, you're wrong. It was my husband, Sigurd, disguised as Gunnar, who rode through the ring of fire. And for proof, that engagement ring is from the treasure of the dragon Fafnir. And she looks at it, somehow rec recognizes that. <laughs> and then decides she is so angry that she has to kill Sigurd. Right? To, to a lot of people, this is a non sequitur. Like, why does she want to kill him? Why does she want to kill the people that betrayed her? Because he forgot. Um, anyway, uh, her husband can't do it because they're blood brothers, so he has his much younger brother, who was too young to swear blood brotherhood with him, uh, murder Sigurd, and there's three different versions of exactly how that happens. But the, uh, uh, the sort of favored narrative in the Icelandic tradition is that he stabs him in bed, and um, Guthrun wakes up in a pool of Sigurd's blood. That's a lot of fast forward. I will conclude by saying, uh, that, that brief fast forward by saying, notice how groomed the hero Sigurd is by the god Odin throughout his story. He meets Odin multiple times, right? Odin helps him pick his horse. Odin tells him how to kill the dragon. Odin appears and gives him advice on the ship. Odin's always there kind of shepherding him. And the same thing happened to his father, Sigmundur. And Sigmundur was finally harvested by Odin, right? Odin wants you to die in battle so he can take you into his hall of Valhalla and you can become part of his army to help him fight against his enemies at Ragnarok. If I need to rewind to talk more about that, I will. But Sigmundur is actually harvested by Odin. Sigmund goes out to battle and sees an old man he's never seen before, <laughs> right? This is how Odin is always described. Somehow you never recognize him. And um, he, he breaks Sigmund's sword and Sigmund is killed in the ensuing battle. So Sigmund goes to Valhalla. Sigurd doesn't, right? Because he didn't die in battle because he was murdered in bed. Sigurd goes to hell, H-E, one L, which is the only other option. Um, so he's lost to Odin's army. So in fact, this hero that, that the god has been grooming this entire time uh, is, is lost to him. So the Valkyrie costs him two people he wanted, right? Because this whole thing started with her because she didn't kill the man she, that he wanted her to. Well, she also kills Sigurd, who he didn't want her to, at least not that way. I know there were a host of hands over here. Mr. Estrich. So at the start of the presentation, you talked about the comic book narrative structure. I was wondering if you could further address the origins of that. Is this something the people at the time would expect? Was it a product of the sort of telephone-like oral tradition or caused by something else? I think if I heard you right and there's some feedback on the mic or some echo where I'm standing, um, most of what we're seeing with the way that these stories develop in all these different directions is just oral telephone. Um, I've seen it with my own family, right? My, my great uncle had a million stories and I heard a fair amount of them from the horse's mouth as it were. Um, but now my dad tells them a little different from how I tell them and I tell them a little different from how my brother told them. And just gradually, I suspect those get passed down in, in different ways that way. I think also part of what happens is some of the weirder elements in these stories must originate from quite possibly a dream or from just some strange, funny idea someone had. I mean, many people are named animals. Right, so you meet many people in the sagas named wolf, named bear, named raven, named otter. And sometimes I wonder with this, this part early in Regan's Mall, we have otter named, who's an otter named otter. It, it almost seems like someone said, well, <laughs> did you ever hear about the otter that was actually an otter? <laughs> and, and what that led to, 
sometimes I wonder if it's almost something that grew out of like an overdone pun almost. You know, you notice that there's no explanation for whether Otter was named Otter because he became an Otter. <laughs> right? was, was he named Otter before he was an Otter? I don't know. Was he always an Otter? That's also possible. Um, earlier in the Saga of the Volsings, we meet a man who's the son of a wolf, and it's just a wolf. So I think, again, I might not have heard you completely right, but I think as far as the, the variation in these stories goes, it's mostly that oral telephone game, but I think also just over time, people add things because they seemed funny or they seemed like an interesting twist on a word. They, there's a lot of wordplay in these stories in the original. Is that close to what you asked? Okay. Uh, from San Antonio, I have a couple questions about the role of fate and free, free will. Is there freedom? Um, and specifically, what effect, if you have this kind of destiny toward Ragnarok, how does that affect, is there a pessimism about these stories? So fate, free will, kind of the end of all things and how that affects storytelling and how you see human action. Hmm. I think it is pessimistic, but it's an empowered pessimism. It's never a pessimism that says, everything is going to go terribly, so I'm not going to do anything about it. It's everything's going to go terribly, I'm gonna do what I can to make it somewhat better. Um, everything is fated to die, and that includes the gods. The gods have their fated death day at Ragnarok. In fact, Odin knows exactly how he's going to die. He's going to be swallowed by the wolf Fenrir. And so, because Odin is desperate to forestall that, he has his Valkyries gather the men who are killed in battle to bring them up to Valhalla to become part of his army to try to defeat the wolf Fenrir. But in every version of the story that we read, he's just swallowed by the wolf and all those guys get killed by the other monsters. And there's nothing he can actually do to forestall it, but there's some virtue in not just passively accepting it and trying to forestall it somewhat. Now with human beings on an individual level, uh, this is not necessarily quite so dramatic because it's very unlikely that we'll actually know the specific way or specific day we'll die like Odin does. But each one of us does have an assigned specific day. So the way this works, and actually in uh, Fault in Small, Sigurd alludes to this, uh, when he says that every man will rule his wealth until his fated day to die. So in Old Norse, the term for that is simply the one day. Everyone has the one day. And so you don't know what day that is. Maybe for me, it's September 27th, 2021. Well, what that means is no matter what I do today, I'm going to die. Um, this plays into afterlife beliefs because you have two options, at, at least in the classical Norse tradition. A man who dies in battle goes to Valhalla, which, you know, you fight forever and ever and ever, uh, only to help Odin fight his last fight that he's going to fail in. Or you go to hell, one L. Not a place of punishment necessarily, but a boring shadow of the, of the living world. Now, since the only way to go to the glorious afterlife Valhalla is to die in battle, this means that there's somewhat different cultural incentives around combat and around insults, right? So if I'm walking down the streets of Dallas later today and someone shouts at me, nice hat dork, in our culture, what's the best thing for me to do? Probably just ignore it, walk on, be the better man. But from this perspective, what's the right thing for me to do? I'm gonna go fight that guy. And if he kills me, I was gonna die today anyway. So all this means is that I chose to go to the good afterlife, at least the, the, the glorious afterlife is a better term for it, right? If I don't fight him, if I walk on, be the bigger man, I'm gonna go back to my hotel room and the bed from the next room over is gonna, you know, collapse on me and kill me at 11.59 p.m. I'm gonna die that day no matter what. So to, to make a, a long story as pithy as I can there, uh, 
it's, not a, it's never a choice between doom and no doom. <laughs> it's a choice between facing that doom well or choosing not to face it. As Beowulf says in a closely related tradition, right? Weird of nere den fadne eero thona his elendech. Luck often saves a man if his courage holds. See, we've got a question back here. If you give me just a second. What is the value of these stories? What is the value of these stories to the people who made them? What is the value to you? Why have you decided to pursue this? And if you do think that it's not just a quirk that you have, what should be the value to us when we come away with this? Is it truth? Do they have a great sense of truth in them? Is it just that they're beautiful stories? Or do you just, do you just like them? I don't know. All right. That's a trilogy of related questions. I think that the original creators of these stories probably for the most part saw them as entertainment. Most of the poems in the Eddas and most of the sagas have kind of a tone of like an adventure story, right? What's going to come next? Uh, who's going to kill who? Is the hero going to survive? Is he going to get the girl? Which girl? <laughs> what did the bird say? Um, I think then there's a secondary purpose, maybe not always very conscious in the original creator's minds, of inculcating certain values, foremost, of course, in the Norse world being courage, right, the indispensable virtue for them. Um, but also other, uh, to us, maybe more peripheral values, hospitality is a huge virtue in these stories. You never harm a guest, you never harm a host. And once you've stayed at someone's house, and you can see this in the Iliad too, of course, uh, there's a certain relationship between you. So I think mostly the conscious goal is to entertain, right? Tell stories around some dark campfires with a secondary value of passing on some, some virtues. Tertiary value for some of the poems, showing off. Um, you read some of these poems and they will have like 30 synonyms used for the same thing. You say, yeah, this is a great way for a poet to say, this is how great I am at poetry. Watch me, I can alliterate with anything. Give me anything, I'll make it alliterate with another word. I think for us, of course, who am I to tell anyone else what value to take from something, but I'll tell you some value that I take from these stories. Um, I am always struck by the way that in Norse myths and sagas, the fiercest conflicts are between people who you really can't say who the good guys and who the bad guys are, right? Even between the gods and the Jotnar anti-gods, there's Jotnar who seem perfectly fine and gods who seem pretty wicked. Um, and then in the sagas, you so often have your grand final conflict between two men who maybe respect one another, maybe are even relatives, uh, but who are compelled by duty, by an oath they swore, or by some closer relative that they have to avenge uh, to come into conflict. And I think, you know, not to get too real as the kids say, but I, but I think for someone who has dealt with a lot of intra-family conflict, that has actually probably helped season me for some of those conflicts. Because rather than seeing a family member that I am in some terrible fight with as, um, as, as evil, right, as someone that I need to write off, I can still value the relationship even while we conflict about some discrete thing. So that's a small value that I take from it. Um, as far as why I got into this, there's a short version, a medium version, and a long version. The short version probably is that I, it was actually language for the most part. I was a, a I studied historical linguistics as a master's student. And my advisor told me that I needed to pick a language or group of languages to get my PhD in, because he said, that's how you get jobs. And I said, well, I guess I'll do Scandinavian because I think it's interesting how these languages are so closely related to English and yet so different. I call them the forgotten sisters. It doesn't hurt 
that the stuff you can read in Old Norse is actually fun to read. Right? You can get lots of ancient languages that are kind of cool, Gothic, Old Church Slavic, maybe Elamite if you want to do a real deep cut. But, you know, you've got like some commentaries on commentaries on the Bible or something like that. With Old Norse literature, you actually have neat stuff to read, wild adventure stories and, and, and such. And, and also, I was very drawn from an early age to Havamal, the, the wisdom of Odin. That's the short version of how I came to it. From a couple of these uh, questions coming in, they seem to be about this idea of the advice that's given and not taking the advice. Um, is there generally seem to be a, a point of this pattern of not taking advice? And in addition, is there different kinds of advice that we see from the sentient animals, the women, the men? Hmm. Do we see different angles of that, that kind of advice? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, that, that last part is, is, is a, a good point um, because women as advice figures often tend more toward the magical side of things. And you do see that in Sigurd Riva, the Valkyrie talking to, to Sigurd, right? Telling him about the magic runes that he needs to learn. Um, I don't know that I can say that there is a point exactly to the not following advice, other than that it is a really, really consistent trope. Um, maybe there's something there that almost shades toward a moral about how, uh, listen, kid, you don't follow my advice, you're gonna wind up like Sigurd in that story. Something like that, I don't know. That may be too pat, but that might be as close as I can think of to a, a reason this recurs so often. Great. Uh, Dr. Crawford, I think we have time for one more question. So let me take one more out here. Okay, right here, just a second. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Is it giving too much feedback? I can hear you right now. Okay, good. Okay, so I have a question about fate as well, um, specifically acting outside of fate. Um, and I was looking at um, Faf Fafnismal. Is it okay, Fafnismal? Okay, good. Um, and in the very last paragraph of the poetry, um, they're talking, the, the birds are talking to Sigrith, uh, or Sigrid, about um, Sigurdrifa. And they, they say, they say no one can break Sigurdrifa's sleep. No one can change what fate has determined. Does he break fate when he wakes her up? Or is it just that they say is not actually the Norns, but it's like someone else? Well, as you said that, I looked up what it says in the original. And uh, it is the decisions of the Norns, the determinations of the Norns. So apparently at least the birds consider it a more or less unbreakable fate that Sigurdriva has that she can't be broken out of her sleep. But I will also point something else out here that I think is important to remember, which is that, and I'll, I'll back up a uh, half step. I talk about this stuff, Norse mythology, to some pretty wide audiences, and that can include some, you would not believe how popular this stuff is. I'm not saying like my stuff, I mean like Norse mythology in general. This is some of the most popular stuff in the world right now. And people want straight answers about things. And so often I find myself in a position where I, I, I try to issue these reminders uh, about the fact that just like us, they don't always talk very literally about the stuff that they have supernatural beliefs in. So fate is a good example, but I think I can maybe make my point better if I, if I talk about the afterlife for a moment. In a given day, while you are, just while you're driving to work, you might seemingly express six different beliefs in the afterlife, right? You might say, I'll roll over in my grave. You might say, I'll come back as a ghost and haunt this place. Someone will cut you off in traffic and you'll say, see you and, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you might, with two L's, <laughs> uh, yeah. right? You might, you, you might say, gosh, I hope I come back as a bird. 
you know, I don't know, you, you, you might explain to your kid how, you know, Fido is in heaven. And, and this seems like contradictory beliefs, right? But you're not talking about it just as a little, literal expression of belief. So in the same way, in the Norse sagas, men kill one another in battle and then say, I sent him to hell. Well, according to the classical understanding of your belief system, you didn't, you sent him to Valhalla, right? But it's just, it's, so there's both literal belief talk and then there's a more literary figurative talk and it happens simultaneously. And I think that's probably what's happening here. Also keep in mind that in poetry like this, uh, it, is, it, it doesn't rhyme like our poetry, but it alliterates. So much of the word choice is based on what can I alliterate, right? So you can, you can hear it in this if I read it, that stanza. Knotu magr sjo möi und sjomi to efro viki vingsgorni re mo at sigr drivar svevni bregda skjoldunga nidr fir skopum norna. So those last two lines, we have ska, na, and then ska, na. So the poet is showing off with, with the alliteration too, and skopum norna, determinations of the norns, fits very perfectly there as a line. So we have to think about that. My executive summary. <laughs> there's not just literal talk about beliefs here, but there's also figurative talk for story purposes and poetic purposes. Dr. Crawford, thank you. I, I, I believe that I speak for all of us in saying we're so glad to have had you here with us today and to uh, would love to ask even a few more questions after <laughs> this is over. We've had a stream of questions from San Antonio that weren't able to be even addressed um, clearly, this is very interesting. So thank you so much. Let's thank give a, a round of applause, please. Thank you.